the relationship between language and the way we think. Next, a conversation on the use of profanity, hosted by the Smithsonian Associates. This program is just over an hour. It contains language that some may find offensive. Thank you very much, and it is a real honor to uh, give a talk associated with these two magnificent institutions. This uh, old woodcut of the story of the blind men and the elephant reminds us that any complex subject can be studied in multiple ways, and that is certainly true of a subject as complex as human nature. Anthropology can illuminate human nature by showing uh, the way that all human cultures display similar patterns of behavior and uh, belief, and also how cultures vary from one another. Biology can show how evolution uh, selected the genes that go into the development of the brain. Psychology can get people to disclose their foibles in laboratory studies. And even fiction can provide insight into human nature by documenting the universal themes that fascinate people in myths and stories. Tonight, I'm going to give you the view from language, what insight we can gain into thought, emotion, and social relationships from words and how we use them. I'll talk about grammar as a window into thought, swearing as a window into emotion, and innuendo as a window into social relationships. In each case, I'll start with a puzzle in language itself, show how it reveals a much deeper feature of the human mind, using specific examples from English, the language with which we are all familiar, but examples that have counterparts in many other languages and that follow a logic that can be seen in all languages. Let me begin with language as a window into thought, and the puzzles that will uh, inspire this discussion come from a wonderful book by Richard Lederer called Crazy English, in which he asks, you have to marvel at the unique lunacy of a language where a house can burn up as it burns down, and in which you fill in a form by filling it out. <laughs> Why is it called after dark when it is really after light? Things that we claim are underwater and underground are surrounded by, not under, the water and ground. So the first puzzle is, why do languages talk about the physical world in such crazy ways? And the answer I'm going to suggest is that there is a theory of physics embedded in our language, a concept of space in our prepositions, a concept of matter in our nouns, a concept of time in our tenses, and a concept of causality in our verbs and that understanding the intuitive physics in language helps explain the quirks of language that make it so seemingly crazy, but also the mental models that humans use to make sense of their lives. So let me begin with space and language. How do we locate an object relative to a place in our uh, everyday speech? One could imagine a hypothetical system of prepositions that would locate an object precisely by having, say, six syllables in each preposition, one each for distance of the object from the place in the up, down, left, right, and near, far directions, and then three more syllables for the angle of pitch, ro roll, and yaw. Uh, needless to say, no language uses such a system. <laughs> Instead, location is digitized in language. We have binary distinctions like near versus far, on versus off, in versus out, on versus under, which is the basis for the wisecrack by Groucho Marx. If I held you any closer, I'd be on the other side of you. <laughs> also, in language, scale is relative. You can use the same uh, spatial term across to refer to an ant walking across someone's hand and a bus driving across the country. And similarly, the meaning of there, as in put it there, will be very different depending on whether it is uttered by a crane operator or a brain surgeon. <laughs> Third, shape is schematic. In reality, all objects are three-dimensional arrangements of matter, but language idealizes them as essentially uh, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional. So we have uh, the word line, which uh, of course uh, refers to a one-dimensional entity. We also have a word like road, which refers to a, an entity that we think of as one-dimensional, although also uh, fattened by uh, a finite width. We have the word beam, for also for a one-dimensional entity, but this time plumped out by a two-dimensional cross-section. 
We have words like surface for a, uh, an object that we conceive as being stretched out in two dimensions and sla slab for an object that we conceive of as also spread out in two directions but thickened by a uh, finite thickness. Now this idealized geometry governs our prepositions. For example, the word along requires a one-dimensional object. You can say the ant walked along the line or along the road or along the beam, but not along the plate or along the ball. Uh, it governs our use of nouns to identify shapes. We don't refer to a wire as a long skinny cylinder. Uh, nor a, a CD as a short fat cylinder, even though a geometer would say that's exactly what they are, because we choose to ignore certain dimensions when we conceptualize objects and conceive of them uh, with other dimensions. It also goes into our general sense of shape. And my favorite example is a um, speech error by, or a, um, uh, really an utterance by a child who told her father, I don't want the little crayon box, I want the box that looks like an audience. <laughs> that is, not the eight crayon box of, Cronola, of Crayola crayons that's flat, but the 64 crayon box where the crayons are arranged in pitched rows like the tiers of an auditorium. Uh, the boundaries of objects are treated like they're objects themselves. We have words like edge that refer to the 1D boundary of a two-dimensional surface. Uh, and so that we can say the, the ant walked along the edge of the plate, even though we can't say the uh, ant walked along the plate. We have words like end for the boundary of a 1D ribbon or a 2D beam. You could even cut the end off a ribbon, which geometrically is uh, impossible because the end doesn't have uh, a dimension that allows it to be cut off, but we conceive of the end as if it was an object in its own right. And that solves the puzzle of why we uh, say underwater and underground when the thing is surrounded by water or ground. The reason is that we can use the words water and ground to refer to the 2D boundary of a 3D volume, not just the volume itself, and so uh, someone can be under that boundary. Now why is the language of space so crazy? Well, the reason is that prepositions divide space up into regions with different causal consequences. And a clear illustration of that comes from a story that I clipped out of the Boston Globe a few years ago. Woman rescued from frozen pond dies. A woman who fell through thin ice Sunday and was underwater for 90 minutes died yesterday. The Lincoln Fire Department said a miscommunication between the caller who reported the accident and the dispatcher significantly delayed her rescue. The rescue workers believed that a woman had fallen on the ice, not through it, and that left the rescuers combing the woods to find the scene of the accident. So on versus through divides up space and trajectories into two regions with, uh, in this case, tragically different causal consequences. Let me turn to substance in language. Language primarily distinguishes the stuff that things are made of from the things themselves. And you can uh, divide up all the matter in the universe according to the four different ways that uh, the syntax of nouns work. There are countable things, such as an apple, masses, like much applesauce, plurals, like many apples, and collections, like a dozen apples. And these aren't so much four kinds of matter as four ways of looking at matter, because we can look at the same matter and construe it in alternative ways. For example, a bunch of stone fragments can be seen as many pebbles, that is a set of individual objects, or as much gravel, an am amorphous substance without boundaries. And we all know the cliche about the uh, person who can't see the forest for the trees. Hence, in crazy English, Lederer could uh, ask, why does a man with hair on his head have more hair than a man with hairs on his head? <laughs> why is the language of substance so crazy? Well, words for matter allow people to agree on how to package and quantify the material world. And an obvious example of that is when you have to transact uh, hunks of the material world, such as in a, a supermarket or other place in which commodities are sold, where the same amount of matter can be priced uh, per item by weight or by the dozen. And interestingly, the same mindset that we use to package and quantify matter, we also apply to uh, abstract concepts, uh, as when we distinguish many opinions, things that we can count, from much advice, amorphous stuff without boundaries. Uh, likewise, we can apply this mindset to packaging happenings in time. 
For example, how many events took place on 9-11-2001 in New York? Uh, one way of looking at it would say that a, that a single event took place, namely a single plan was executed. Uh, another way of looking at it is that two events took place because two buildings were destroyed at slightly different times. Now this might strike you as the ultimate in semantics, in uh, picking nits or debating how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. But as uh, someone who wrote a book on semantics, I, I use this example to show that semantics can be consequential. The reason is that the leaseholder for the World Trade Center held a, an insurance policy that entitled him to three and a half billion dollars, quote, per destructive event. If 9-11 comprised one event, he stood to gain three and a half billion dollars. If it comprised two events, he stood to gain seven billion dollars. So the semantics of an event turns out to be worth $3.5 billion, and the case was tied up in uh, numerous uh, legal trials for many, many years. Now, uh, this brings us to the language of time, and as the example of packaging events into units like objects shows, in language, time is often conceived like space, and happenings are conceived like matter, a kind of time stuff that can be extruded and stretched out along a line. We see this in spatial metaphors for time, like the deadline is coming or we're approaching the deadline. We see it in children's speech as when a child says, can I have any reading behind the dinner, that is after dinner, uh, a form that obviously they didn't memorize from their parents, so must have revealed the similarity between space and time that occurred to that child. And we see it in the semantics of verb tense. In tense, as in uh, the treatment of space, time is digitized and time is relative. That is, just as no language has a set of coordinates to express uh, space, no language uses dates and hours and minutes to express time in its tense system, like November 7th, 3.42 p.m. Instead, location in time is quantized in English into three regions relative to the reference point of the moment of speaking. So one has the uh, present tense, uh, which corresponds to what William James called the specious present, an interval of about three seconds that moves through time that captures the duration in, that we seem to experience all at once as a totality. So the specious presence present of about three seconds is the duration of a deliberate action like a handshake. It's the duration of a quick decision, such as when channel surfing, how long you will light on a channel before going on to the next one. <laughs> of the decay of short-term memory when it is unrehearsed. Of a line of poetry, that's a, a one of the great human universals, is that in all cultures a line of poetry takes about three seconds. And of a memorable musical motif, like the opening notes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Then the second region that we use to reckon time in language is the past stretching backwards indefinitely. All events from the Big Bang to four seconds ago are treated identically uh, in language, which is why Groucho could say, I've had a wonderful evening, but this wasn't it. <laughs> And the third region in which time is divided is the future uh, until eternity. Uh, now, there are not only locations in time, but there are also shapes in time, what linguists call aspects. And shape in time, like shape in space, is treated schematically as a few uh, generic kinds of uh, blobs and points. We have an action like shake with no clear beginning or ending, a kind of amorphous mass uh, stretched out along the timeline. We've got events that are momentaneous or conceived of as punctate, like to swat a fly. And we have events that have no clear beginning but are terminated with a crisp ending when some uh, state or goal has been attained, such as to cross the street, which is over as soon as you get to the other side. Now, stretches of time can be mentally packaged. Just as in matter, we can take a noun for a mass, like beer, an amorphous uh, substance without any boundaries, and convert it to a, uh, an object, as in one beer with uh, recognizable boundaries, we can take an amorphous stretch of time, like shake it, and with the use of particles, like out, up, uh, convert it to a, uh, 
a, um, an event with a crisp end state. Uh, likewise, we can take Ringit, uh, which is uh, a process without a clear endpoint, and by adding the particle out, turn it to Ringit out, which uh, again means to completion until uh, it's, uh, no water is left. And it's because of this ability of words like up and out to chop continuous stretches of activity into events with an end state that crazy English could note that a house can burn up as it burns down, that is to completion, and you can fill in a form by filling it out. Uh, the boundary of an event in time uh, can be, like the boundary of a mass in space, can be treated like an event itself. Just as you can cut off the end of a ribbon, uh, which is geometrically impossible, you can start the end of a talk, uh, which if, you, if the end of a talk was simply an instantaneous moment at which it was over, is impossible, but we conceive of the boundary as if it was a unit itself. Hence, why is it called after dark when it is really after light? Well, the reason is that the word dark can refer to an instant bounding an event in time, uh, and it's exactly analogous to the question in space of why do we say underwater when a thing is surrounded by water, the boundary of an object or an event can be treated as an object or an event itself. Why is the language of time so crazy? Well, locations in time um, are stretches of time uh, relative to the moment of speaking, uh, and time is reckoned that way because they have different consequences for knowledge and action. So another way of, uh, a fancy schmancy way of putting it is that tense uh, smuggles in some metaphysics and epistemology and it is not strictly a concept of chronology. The present corresponds to our consciousness. Being alive and awake and aware, that's what the present tense is all about. The past is what we conceive of as knowable, factual, and unchangeable. An example is the Scott Peterson murder case uh, in which the paper noted that uh, investigators noted that Peterson used the past tense when referring to his wife and unborn son before their bodies were found, abruptly correcting uh, himself. So the past tense betrays a state of knowledge and it's not just any old interval in time. Conversely, the future is that stretch of time which we conceive of as unknowable, hypothetical, and willable. And in fact, those concepts are often conflated with the uh, future tense in many languages, including English. As when Winston Churchill said, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. He meant it not just as a prediction of what would happen at some future date, but as a declaration of will. And indeed, when you think about it, it isn't so easy to pull those two concepts apart. Uh, finally, let me turn to causality in language. And the model of causality in language can more or less be summarized by this diagram. Uh, that is, one billiard ball clacking into another and sending it on its way. Uh, the concept of causality in language is one is of, a, of an actor directly impinging on an entity, making it move or change. And psychologist Philip Wolfe has demonstrated this in a simple experiment involving some computer animations. In this frame, a woman grasps a doorknob and uh, causes the door to open by uh, manhandling it directly. In this frame, she opens a window and the wind comes in and it blows the door open. If you ask people, did Sarah cause the door to open, in the first direct action case they say yes and in the indirect case they say yes, but if you look for causality expressed directly in the verb, if you say did Sarah open the door, then in the first case they say yes, but in the second case they say no. So there's a difference between causing uh, something to open and opening it, and it's the difference uh, between indirect, mediated, uh, circuitous causation versus direct physical manipulation. Well, why is the language of causality so crazy? It's because directly cause of caused events are the ones that are most likely to be foreseeable and intended, hence those for which we can hold people responsible. When the directness of causation is fuzzy, so is our sense of moral and legal responsibility. And a nice example of that comes from an event in uh, 1881 when President James Garfield was shot by an assassin, uh, Charles Guiteau, but the bullet did not strike an artery or major organ. The uh, wound uh, was not fatal and, it, and uh, needn't even have been um, fatal in 
Garfield's time, except he was subjected to the harebrained medical practices of the day. Uh, the doctors, for example, probed his wound with unwashed hands, and they had the idea of feeding him through his rectum instead of his mouth. Uh, and as a result, Garfield lingered on his deathbed for three months until he finally succumbed of infection and, uh, and um, starvation. At the assassin's trial, Guiteau said, the doctors killed him, I just shot him. <laughs> the jury disagreed and uh, Guiteau was hanged. More evidence of the consequential nature of lexical semantics. <laughs> Okay, to sum up language as a window into cognition, there's a theory of physics embedded in our language, uh, a theory of space comprising places and objects in qualitative relationships, a conception of matter as stuff and things stretched out along one, two, or three dimensions, a conception of time in terms of processes and events that are located and stretched along a single dimension, and a conception of causa causation in terms of the direct impingement of an actor upon an entity. This way of construing reality differs from real physics, but it corresponds to human goals and purposes, the causal texture of the human environment, what is knowable, factual, and willable, ways of packaging and measuring our experience, and ways of assigning responsibility for events. Well, let me turn now from cognition to emotion and use language as a window into emotion. The event I'll begin with occurred four years ago, and it was at the Glo Golden Globe Awards, broadcast live on NBC television. Accepting an award on behalf of the rock group U2, Bono said, and I quote, this is really, really fucking brilliant. <laughs> now, those of you watching on uh, C-SPAN will note that uh, I was not bleeped for saying that word because on cable television, as any fan of The Sopranos knows, you can say anything you want, but on but broadcast television is regulated by the FCC, and the FCC has jurisdiction to fine networks for, in, quote, indecency. Now, the FCC uh, was given this case after the switchboards lit up like a Christmas tree, and they chose uh, not to fine NBC because their guidelines define indecency as, quote, material that describes or depicts sexual or excretory organs and activities, and they ruled that the fucking and fucking brilliant is, quote, an adjective or expletive to emphasize an exclamation. <laughs> well, a number of uh, congressmen were uh, outraged and uh, filed legislation designed to close this loophole. And I'll read you one of them. House Resolution 3687, the Clean Airwaves Act, which I will read to you in its entirety. <laughs> Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that Section 1464 of Title 18 United States Code is amended, one, by inserting A before whoever, and two, the term profane used with respect to language includes the words shit, piss, fuck, cunt, asshole, and the phrase is <laughs> cocksucker, motherfucker, and asshole. <laughs> Compound use, including hyphenated compounds of such words and phrases with each other or with other words or phrases, and other grammatical forms of such words and phrases, including verb, adjective, gerund, participle, and infinitive for forms. Unfortunately, if anything, the fucking and fucking brilliant is an adverb, and that's the one part of speech they forgot to include in the legislation. So, grammar matters. So the question is, why do people get so upset about certain words? Indeed, obscene language has defined the main legal battleground of uh, court battles of free speech for most of the, the uh, 20th century. Well, this brings us to the language of swearing, in particular the cognitive neuroscience of swearing. And uh, a, a generalization in this uh, uh, area is that taboo words activate brain areas associated with negative emotion. Uh, 
that hearing a taboo word uh, causes activation in the right hemisphere, which has independently been associated with negative emotion. Producing a swear word involves activity in uh, a complex set of ancient and deeply buried structures in the uh, brain called the basal ganglia, these two uh, complex networks of nuclei in purple. And uh, hearing a swear word or reading one causes activation in the amygdala, two almond-shaped organs, also evolutionarily ancient, buried deep in the brain, that have been associated with threat and fear. Um, also, the other relevant fact about the uh, processes that go on in the brain when you hear a taboo word is that they're processed involuntarily. You can't not hear or read a taboo word without that negative emotion getting uh, activated. And there's a, a simple way to demonstrate that. It involves the Stroop test familiar to every psychology undergraduate and the subject of more than 4,000 scientific papers. The Stroop test is, uh, is straightforward. The task is simply to name the color in which words are printed. So I'm going to give you a list of words, and I'm going to have you do the, the Stroop, Stroop test. Uh, ignore what the words say. Just concentrate on the color of the ink, so to speak. Okay? So with each word, name the color in which it is printed. Okay? Red, black. Easy, okay? Here's a variant of the Stroop test, same instruction, name the color in which the word is printed. Okay? Black, green, red. Okay? It's a lot harder. Uh, that is called the Stroop interference effect, and it simply tells us that in uh, highly literate people, reading is automatic. You can't process a linguistic uh, stimulus except in terms of its meaning and associations. You can't turn that process off or will it not to happen. Now, I mentioned that, that there have been 4,000 scientific papers on the Stroop effect. Of those 4,000, my favorite was done by the psycholinguist Donald Mackay at UCLA. The instructions are the same. Once again, just uh, name aloud the color in which the word is printed, okay? Black, <laughs> green, People are, uh, are slowed down at that task almost as much as when the word is printed in a distracting color. <laughs> and uh, that's because you can't read a swear word without experiencing that emotional ping in your amygdala, uh, which means that swearing can be used as a, as a weapon, a kind of mind control, where you can use language to force a listener to think an unpleasant or at least an emotionally charged thought. And that gives us, uh, in turn, two questions, scientific questions about swearing. What kinds of concepts trigger negative emotions? And why would one speaker want to trigger a negative emotion in the mind of a listener? Well, anyone who, in terms of the uh, contents of swearing, anyone who speaks more than one language knows that the swear words in one language cannot be directly translated into another. Swearing varies from language to language. Nonetheless, there are universals, categories of uh, taboo that can be found in all languages, and they basically fall into five categories. There's the supernatural, as in our own damn hell in Jesus Christ, which are, of course are far milder swear words than they used to be. As recently as 1939, uh, people were scandalized at the end of the movie Gone with the Wind when Rhett Butler said, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Uh, now that would be considered rather genteel language. <laughs> but the emotional punch of uh, religious swearing is still felt in religious societies, and where I grew up in Quebec, uh, I knew that in Quebecois French, the worst thing that you can say when you stub your toe or someone steals your parking space is goddamn tabernacle or goddamn chalice. This is true. <laughs> and this, of course, evokes the emotion of awe and fear at the power of deities. Bodily effluvia and organs are obvious source, sources of uh, taboo words in English, as in shit, piss, asshole, and so on. It's not surprising that these are emotionally evocative words, because epidemiologists tell us that bodily effluvia are major vectors of disease. Many uh, protozoan and uh, parasitic and uh, infectious diseases are transmitted from body to body via bodily secretions. 
we may have evolved an emotion to defend us against this root of disease transmission, it's the emotion of disgust. And that is what is elicited by uh, the, such words. There's disease, death, and infirmity. Uh, we don't have very many taboo words for that in English, but they are quite common in other languages. And in earlier stages of English, you could curse someone by saying a pox on you or a plague on both your houses from Romeo and Juliet. And in uh, Yiddish, there is the curse cholera, cholera. Uh, even uh, today, there is some taboo associated with the word cancer, our most dreaded malady, and often one re reads in, obitua in an obituary that someone has passed away from, quote, a long illness. And of course, this is the emotion of dread of disease, death, and infirmity. Sexuality is the most obvious source of taboo words in English and in many other languages, as in fuck, screw, and so on. Uh, and when people hear this, they often say, well, um, why should thoughts about sex be associated with negative emotions? Isn't sex between consenting adults supposed to be a source of a wholesome, clean fun? Well, maybe sometimes, but in the full sweep of human sexuality, it's also associated with exploitation, illegitimacy, incest, jealousy, spousal abuse, cuckoldry, desertion, child abuse, feuding, and rape. Uh, sex is no small matter in any culture, including our own, and it's not surprising that it should pack an emotional charge, which we can call uh, the emotion revulsion at sexual depravity. Finally, there are taboo words associated with dis disfavored people in groups in many, many languages. For uh, words for infidels, cripples, enemies, and subordinated peoples, and that is especially true of our own language, where by far the most offensive word uh, has nothing to do with excretion or uh, sexuality, but rather with race, the word so uh, incendiary that you can't refer to it but have to use a word for the word, namely the N-word or nigger. And there are uh, corresponding words for other racial minorities, where here the emotion is hatred or contempt. So given that uh, all of these negative emotions that we can be held hostage to, why would one person commit the aggressive act of forcing a negative thought into the brains of another? Well, this is a, turns out to be a complicated question, and there are lots of reasons why people mentally uh, assault each other through language, at least five of them. There's, the first is dysphemistic swearing. Uh, the difference between, say, shit and feces, or fuck and copulate. Words that are, when you think about them, exact synonyms, but obviously differ greatly in their acceptability. Now, you all know what a euphemism is. The logic behind a euphemism is we have to talk about this for a specific purpose, but let's avoid thinking about how awful it is. Now, a dysphemism is a bit of jargon for the exact opposite, a word where the logic is, I want you to think about how awful this is. So just to, to uh, explain the distinction, there are at least uh, 34 euphemisms for feces in uh, contemporary standard English. The reason is we are incarnate beings and feces is a part of life. You can't go through life without ever talking about it. Uh, but in order not to offend your listener, in order to make it completely clear that you are raising the topic, not to gross them out, but rather because it's unavoidable, we have a rich vocabulary of all of, appropriate to all the contexts in which someone might have to uh, discuss feces. There are generic terms like waste and fecal matter, kind of fancy uh, Latin terms and like uh, uh, and feces, excrement, excreta. There are terms that you have to use with children, like poop and doo-doo. There are terms that you use of children uh, in reference to diapers like soil and dirt, terms in a medical context like stool and bowel movement, numerous terms that you use uh, in connection with animals depending on whether you're talking about large units like pets, <laughs> small units like droppings, a scientific context like scat and coprolites, an agricultural context like manure and guano, and in this golden age of recycling, we need a term to refer to uh, human waste that is recycled as fertilizer, and so one hears of night soil, human manure, and my favorite, human biosolids. Uh, and it really makes you wonder why people make so much of a fuss about the fact that the Eskimos have all those words for snow. <laughs> 
Well, if uh, the, the need for euphemisms then is to be able to bring up uh, necessarily disagreeable objects in a, an emotionally neutral context, and you can see that if you imagine using one of these uh, words as a synonym for the other, such as, I, I think you would um, kind of boggle if your uh, next medical appointment, the nurse said, the medical lab will need a doo-doo sample. <laughs> or if you were to uh, open up a gardening book and it said, for nice plump tomatoes, fertilize your plants with cattle bowel movement. <laughs> There are times when we also need dysphemisms, when uh, the time for politeness is past and you want to remind your listener of how truly awful the referent of a, a word is. Uh, and at that point, the English language provides one uh, the means for that kind of communication as well, as when you might open your window and yell at a uh, person, will you pick up your dog shit? Uh, at that point, uh, there is... Uh, not only not a need for a euphemism, but you want to inform the person of how offensive that particular action is, and that's why we have dysphemisms. Or the plumber was working under the sink and I had to look at the crack in his ass the whole time. <laughs> or, so while I've been taking care of the kids, you've been fucking your secretary. <laughs> so if there's a, a need for dysphemistic swearing, uh, a second kind of swearing is abuse of swearing, when the negative emotion is employed to intimidate or humiliate someone, a, uh, a situation that people every once in a while find themselves in. Now, scholars who have devoted themselves to the study of maledicta, of, uh, of curses and imprecations across the world's languages, have often been impressed at the sheer ingenuity of abuse of swearing, of how much brain power goes into the crafting of verbal maledicta. And indeed, all of the poetic devices that you might remember from your college English class, uh, metaphor, imagery, connotation, alliteration, meter, and rhyme are all put to use in uh, abuse of swearing. You can liken people to effluvia uh, and their associated organs and accessories, as a, when you call someone a piece of shit or an asshole or a dickhead. You can advise them to engage in undignified activities, <laughs> such as eat shit, shove it up your ass, or fuck yourself. You can accuse them of having already engaged in undignified sexual activities. And for every undignified sexual activity, there is an abusive curse, such as incest, motherfucker, sodomy, bugger, fellatio, cocksucker, masturbation, jerk or wanker. And my favorite alludes to bestiality. And this is a curse that I, I believe should be revived. I think that when next time you're cut off in traffic, uh, instead of <laughs> reaching for one of those hackneyed cliches that's been drained of its imagery long ago, I suggest you advise the uh, offending driver to kiss the cunt of a cow. <laughs> uh, a, uh, a curse that originates from 1585 uh, and which not only has some, at least has some fresh imagery, but has a rather pleasing alliteration. <laughs> Well, then there's idiomatic swearing, um, terms where it's completely unclear what the referent of the word has to do with the current context. <laughs> like, shit out of luck, get your shit together, piss poor, pissed off, my ass, a pain in the ass, sweet fuck all, what the fuck. Uh, where there, the, uh, the words are being used sheerly for the emotional impact uh, with no connection whatsoever to their original meaning. Uh, they're there obviously to arouse the listener's attention, to assert a macho or cool pose, uh, or sometimes even to, among peers, to express informality, to, to say this is the kind of setting in which you don't have to uh, watch your words or worry about what you say. And closely related to idiomatic swearing is emphatic swearing, as in Bono's this is really, really fucking brilliant, <laughs> or terms that all of us have heard like he thinks he's a fucking scoutmaster or Rip Van fucking Winkle. <laughs> And the uh, overuse of uh, profanity for emphasis or in idioms leads to the uh, form of speech sometimes called fuck patois, uh, <laughs> as in the story of the soldier who said, I come home to my fucking house after three fucking years in the fucking war, and what do I fucking well find? My wife in bed engaging in illicit sexual relations <laughs> with a man. <laughs> <laughs> Finally,
finally, there's cathartic swearing, the strange phenomenon in which when some misfortune befalls you, you uh, slice your thumb along with a bagel or you uh, knock a glass of red wine onto your lap, uh, the topic of your conversation abruptly turns to sexuality or excretion. <laughs> so what's going on there? Well, the theory that most people will offer is that it, um, it lets off steam. It relieves tension, the so-called hydraulic theory uh, of the mind. <laughs> But in fact, neurobiologists tell us that the skull literally does not contain a boiler with steam or a network of uh, pipes and valves, but only brain cells that fire in patterns. And so this leads to uh, a somewhat more satisfying explanation called the rage circuit theory, namely that throughout the mammals, there one finds a reflex where an animal that's suddenly injured or confined will emit a sudden angry noise to startle or intimidate an attacker. And any of you who have stepped on the tail of a cat uh, will be familiar with this reflex. Uh, the idea is that we humans have inherited this reflex, except in our case, this uh, vocal uh, urge also triggers the language system because our language system has commandeered uh, partial control over the vocal tract in the course of human evolution. And so as well as just emitting a, a yowl, we articulate our scream with an aggressive word with negative affect, indeed one that we're ordinarily inhibited uh, from making. Now the only problem with the, the uh, rage circuit theory, although I think it explains part of the phenomenon, is that cathartic swearing is conventional. Again, those of you who are multilingual will know that you have to learn to swear in a particular language. You have to know what to scream in what circumstances. Uh, and even in English, the different swear words have uh, different connections to the kind of uh, insult or, uh, or misfortune. If you uh, knock over uh, a glass into your lap, you don't uh, shout out uh, whore, although in many other languages, <laughs> in, in many other languages you do, um, and, and uh, nor do you say asshole, but that's what you might say if the cause of the misfortune was another human being. So there is a, a conventional aspect to swearing. These are words that you have to learn the way you learn other words in the language. This leads to the suggestion of the brilliant sociologist Irving Goffman, of, called the response cry theory, namely the cathartic swearing is communicative. It informs bystanders, bystanders of the emotional state that you're currently experiencing and a bit about what causes it. And therefore, it's like other response cries in the language, like aha, mm, ouch, whoops, wow, yes, uh, and yuck, which have no syntax, but nonetheless are uh, connections between form and meaning. So to sum up language as a window into emotion, humans are prone to strong negative emotions, awe of the supernatural, disgust at bodily effluvia, dread of disease, hatred of disfavored people and groups, revulsion at depraved sexual acts. Nonetheless, people sometimes want to impose these thoughts on others to gain their attention, to intimidate or humiliate them, to remind them of the awfulness of the objects and activities, or to advertise that one has the normal reactions to life's misfortunes. Part three is language as a window into social relationships. And let me again begin with a puzzle. This one is taken from the film Fargo, in a scene early in the movie, in which a kidnapper has a hostage in the back seat of the car, is pulled over by a police officer because he's missing his license plates, is asked to show his driver's license, and proffers his wallet with the driver's license showing and a $50 bill extending from it ever so slightly. And he says to the officer, I was thinking that maybe the best thing would be to take care of it here in Brainerd, which we assume the officer interprets as the audience interprets as a veiled bribe. This is an example of an indirect speech act, a case in which we don't blurt out our intentions, but veil them with innuendo or doublespeak, uh, even though both parties know exactly what the message is. Here are some other examples. If you could pass the guacamole, that would be awesome. A uh, <laughs> statement that doesn't make a whole lot of sense on the face of it, but which we all uh, understand as a polite request. Anyone who has sat through a fundraising dinner is familiar with euphemistic schnorring, like we're counting on you to show leadership in our campaign for the future, i.e. give money. Would you like to come up and see my etchings? 
That has been a, uh, a sexual come on for so long that in the 1930s, James Thurber could draw a cartoon with a somewhat confused young man saying to his date, you wait here and I'll bring the etchings down. <laughs> And then there's a nice story you got there. It would be a real shame if something happened to it, the uh, prototypical veiled threat. Well, why are bribes, requests, seductions, solicitations, and threats so often veiled when both parties know exactly what they mean? This isn't just a, uh, an academic question, but it has practical importance in the interpretation and crafting of the language of diplomacy and in the prosecution of extortion, bribery, and sexual harassment. The solution turns out to be uh, surprisingly elusive and comes in three parts. The logic of plausible deniability, the logic of relationship negotiation, and the logic of mutual knowledge. And I'll explain uh, what each one of these means. Let me, me begin with plausible deniability. Uh, Thomas Schelling, the Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, laid out what he called the identification problem in game theory. Namely, how do you deal with another intelligent agent when you don't know his or her values? And bribing a police officer is a prime example. You've got two options. You, let, imagine that you just have two options, namely uh, to offer an overt bribe or not to say anything at all. You might be faced with two different kinds of officers, a dishonest officer who would uh, accept the bribe and let you go free, or an honest officer who would not only rebuff the bribe, but uh, might arrest you for attempting to bribe an officer. And so, of course, the payoffs are wildly asymmetrical. In the case of not offering a bribe at all, nothing ventured, nothing gained, there's a traffic ticket in each case. In the case of tendering the bribe, uh, you've got very skewed costs and benefits. With a dishonest officer, you have the high payoff of going free. With an honest officer, you have the high cost of an arrest for bribery. Or in the case of Fargo, an arrest for kidnapping. Now, if you can offer a veiled bribe, though, then you get the best of both worlds. A dis dishonest officer can sniff out the bribe in the innuendo, and you get the high payoff of going free. An honest officer with a higher threshold of having to make a uh, charge of uh, attempting, uh, attempted bribery sticking in court beyond a reasonable doubt could not nail you on the, the, with that uh, vague proposition. And so the worst you have is a traffic ticket. You get the very high payoff of offering a bribe, but the uh, relatively low cost of not bribing at all combined into one option. So this is the logic of plausible deniability, not much of a surprise, but it raises the question of why we use indirect speech in non-legal contexts, cases in which there isn't an officer uh, who is empowered to uh, arrest you, uh, and, uh, but nonetheless people still use weasel words. So why do you have to veil, say, a bribe in everyday life? Now you might think, a bribe in everyday life? When would a upstanding, law-abiding citizen be tempted to offer a bribe in everyday life. Well, how's this? You want to go to the hottest restaurant in town, you have no reservation. Why not try bribing the maitre d' to seat you immediately? Well, this was an assignment given to the food writer, Bruce Feiler, by Gourmet Magazine, and a report of his experience is, uh, I found, highly instructive. First of all, there was extreme anxiety. This is the way his uh, article opens. I am nervous, truly nervous. As the taxi bounces through the trendier neighborhoods of Manhattan, I keep imagining the possible retorts of some incensed maitre d'. What kind of an establishment do you think this is? How dare you insult me? Do you think you can get in with that? <laughs> Second interesting outcome. When he did screw up the courage to offer a bribe, he did it in an indirect speech act, which he concocted on the spot, a different one with each restaurant, such as, I hope you can fit us in, he said, as he discreetly held the $50 bill uh, in the maitre d's peripheral vision. Can you speed up my weight? I was wondering if you might have a cancellation. And the, the uh, best one is, this is a really important night for me. <laughs> The third interesting outcome of this um, natural experiment is the, uh, the outcome itself, which was, as he put it, I was invariably seated in between two and four minutes to the astonishment of my girlfriend. <laughs> yes, a very uh, useful thing to know in life is that maitre d's are bribable. <laughs> 
But then why veil the bribe? As far as I know, no one has ever been sent to jail for trying to bribe a maitre d'. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I think a, a um, hypothesis to explain this is that language has to do two things at once. It has to convey the content, the bribe, the command, the proposition. Simultaneously, it has to negotiate a relationship that you have with a person. And the solution is that language is used at two levels at once. The speaker uses the literal form of his or her words to signal the safest relationship to the listener. And he counts on the listener to read between the lines to entertain a proposition that may be incompatible with that relationship. And a polite request is uh, the most transparent example. What's going on with, if you could pass the guacamole, that would be awesome? Well, the literal content makes no sense. I think you'd agree that it's a bit of an overstatement. I mean, awesome. <laughs> and also, why is a diner speculating about possible worlds uh, then and there? <laughs> well, the listener, assuming that the speaker is uh, minimally sane, uh, thinks the speaker says an outcome is good, therefore he must re be requesting it. The overall intent is that the intended content of an imperative gets through, but without the presumption of dominance. That is, uh, in uttering an imperative, you're presupposing that you can expect the listener's compliance, as if they were some sort of underling or flunky. And to avoid communicating that that's what you think of the listener, uh, then by veiling the request in this uh, polite imperative, as linguists call it, you can uh, eat your cake and have it. So what kind of relationships do people worry about negotiating? Well, there is dominance, as I've mentioned in the politeness case, but the anthropologist Alan Fisk, reviewing the ethnographic literature, suggests that all natural human relationships uh, occur in one of three types. Each prescribes a distinct way of distributing resources, hence the high emotion surrounding them. Each has a distinct evolutionary basis, and each applies most naturally to certain people, but can be extended to others through negotiation. So there's dominance, as I've mentioned, whose logic is don't mess with me, and which presumably originated in the dominance hierarchies that are ubiquitous among uh, primates. There's a very different ethos of communality, whose logic is share and share alike which uh, presumably evolved via kin selection and mutualism and is applied most naturally among kin, between spouses, and among close friends. Then there's a third ethos called uh, reciprocity, whose logic is you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, namely the exchange of goods and services in a business-like relationship whose evolutionary basis is reciprocal altruism. Now critically, behavior that's acceptable in one relationship uh, is perceived as highly anomalous in, a, in another. For example, you, at a cocktail party, you might go over to your uh, boyfriend and help yourself to a shrimp off his plate, or your, or your husband or wife. But you wouldn't go up to your boss and help yourself to a shrimp <laughs> off their plate. Uh, that's because the helping yourself to a shrimp belongs to the mindset of communality, and the relationship a boss exerts over you is one of dominance. Uh, another example, if a friend had you over at a dinner party, and at the end of the meal, you pulled out your wallet and offered to pay him for the cost of the food, um, that would be perceived as rude, not polite. And that's because the mindset of uh, friend friendship is one of communality, not tit-for-tat reciprocity. Now, when uh, these are obvious cases of things that no one would do, but when people have a divergent understanding of which relationship type is in effect in that pair, the divergence can be costly and is experienced as an unpleasant emotion that we call awkwardness. For example, there can be awkward moments in a workplace when a, an employee is not sure whether he can uh, address his boss by his first name or invite him out for a beer after work. Everyone knows that it is very unwise for two fr friends to engage in a business transaction, like one of them selling a car to the other. It puts a strain on the friendship, uh, and that's because of the clash between the communality among friends and the reciprocity necessary to consummate a, uh, a business transaction. The uh, tension between dominance and sex, as in a sexual proposition from a uh, supervisor to an employee, defines the battleground of sexual harassment. And even the uh, conflict between friendship and sex uh, defines all of the frisson of dating. 
So this gives rise to a social identification where the social costs of awkwardness from a mismatched relationship type can duplicate the payoff matrix of a legal identification problem, as in the bribery case. And an example would be bribing a maitre d', which involves the possible clash between authority and reciprocity. Once again, a diner confined to direct speech has the choice between not bribing the maitre d' and offering a naked bribe. Depending on whether he's faced with a corrupt maitre d' who will accept the bribe or a scrupulous maitre d' who will say, what kind of place do you think this is, then the payoffs are quite asymmetrical. In the case of not offering a bribe, uh, the two understandings of the relationship are compatible. That is, the maitre d' exerts dominance over his restaurant fiefdom, so there's no tension there, but the diner gets the long wait in either, cost, um, uh, in either case, a mild cost. In the case of offering a bribe, there's the possibility of a, vi a high payoff of a quick table if the relationship is consummated and the maitre d' uh, agrees to a reciprocity relationship. On the other hand, if the maitre d' insists on maintaining dominance while you've offered reciprocity, the result can be that high cost of awkwardness. But by saying, this is a really important night for me, or I was wondering if you had a cancellation, then you get the uh, possibility of a quick table if you're lucky enough to have a corrupt maitre d', and a, uh, but the small cost of a long wait if you have a scrupulous maitre d'. Okay, that's two-thirds of the solution, and there's one remaining problem, I believe, which is that people aren't naive. Usually both parties know when an overture has been made by an innuendo. I mean, who could honestly claim to be fooled by the uh, uh, idle comment, I was wondering if you might have a cancellation, or would you like to come up and see my etchings? Life isn't a court of law. You don't have to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt. So any deniability is not really plausible. Why would an obvious indirect overture feel less awkward than an overture that is, quote, on the record? What record? Well, my favorite illustration of that comes from a romantic comedy, When Harry Met Sally, an exploration of the social perils of dating and friendship. In a scene early in the movie, uh, Harry has made what Sally interprets as a, uh, a sexual remark, and she says, you're coming on to me. Harry says, what do you want me to do about it? I take it back, okay? I take it back. She says, you can't take it back. Why not? Because it's already out there. Oh, geez, what are we supposed to do? Call the cops? It's already out there. <laughs> well, this is a profound uh, question. What is the status of an overture that we feel to be out there or on the record or once said can't be unsaid that makes it worse than a veiled overture that's implicated indirectly? Um, there are, I think, a, a number of possible solutions, but the one that I find most compelling inheres in the concept that logicians and economists and linguists call mutual knowledge, sometimes common knowledge, which uh, must be distinguished from shared knowledge. Now, in shared knowledge, A knows X and B knows X. In mutual knowledge, A knows X, B knows X, uh, A knows that B knows X, B knows that A knows X, A knows that B knows that A knows X, uh, ad infinitum. And this is a distinction with a, uh, with a, a big difference. Uh, for example, why do democracies enshrine freedom of assembly as a fundamental right, and why are so many political revolutions uh, instigated when a uh, disgruntled crowd assembles in a public square, say in front of a, 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 a palace or military installation? Well, before the assembly, everyone knew that they were individually disgruntled, but when you assemble en masse in a public space, you can now see that everyone else is disgruntled, they can see that you're disgruntled, and everyone can see that everyone else can see. That collective power allows the crowd to challenge the authority that otherwise would be able to pick them off one by one. Likewise, in the story of the emperor's new clothes, when the, the little boy said the emperor is naked, he wasn't telling anyone anything that they didn't already know. But he was conveying information nonetheless. He was conveying the information that now everyone else knew what they knew, and moreover, they knew what everyone else knew. And again, that gave the crowd the collective power to change the relationship with the emperor and challenge his authority. But the moral for this particular discussion is that language, as in the what the little boy shouted out, is an excellent way of generating mutual knowledge. 
So here's the hypothesis. Innuendos merely provide shared knowledge, even when they're obvious, whereas direct speech provides mutual knowledge and re relationships are maintained or nullified by a mutual knowledge of the relationship type. In other words, if Harry were to have said, would you like to come up and see my etchings, then Sally may know that she's turned down an overture, and Harry may know that, he's, that she has turned down an overture, but does Sally know that Harry knows? She could be thinking, maybe Harry thinks I'm naive. And does Harry know that Sally knows that he knows? He could be thinking, maybe Sally thinks I'm dense. So there is no mutual knowledge, and they can maintain the fiction of a friendship. Whereas if Harry had said, would you like to come up and have sex, <laughs> then Harry knows that Sally knows that Harry knows that Sally knows that she's turned down an overture. They cannot maintain the fiction of a friendship, and I think that's what's behind our intuition, that you can't take it back, it's out there. So to sum up language as a window into social relationships, people have to convey messages while unsure of their relationship. Indirect speech can minimize the risks in legal contexts with tangible costs, such as in bribes and threats. The same thing can happen in everyday life because relationship mismatches can have an emotional cost. Also, indirect speech prevents shared knowledge from becoming mutual knowledge, and it's mutual knowledge that's the basis of a relationship. So let me give an overall summary. Often, psychologists have to face the problem of making the familiar seem strange of overcoming the anesthetic of familiarity and getting people to uh, ponder aspects of their own lives that they take for granted because they are uh, so commonly experienced. One way of uh, making the familiar seem strange is to ask uh, what would a Martian psychologist or Martian biologist say uh, about our species if he arrived on our planet and had to characterize us without preconceptions? The question for this evening is, how would a li Martian linguist describe our species, characterizing us only through our words and how we use them? Well, I think he might say something like the following. Humans have an intuitive theory of the physical world. They locate things in space by identifying places and locating objects in discrete relationships to them. They construe matter as formless stuff or discrete things, which are stretched along one, two, or three dimensions. They order and package events in time relative to their own moment of consciousness. And they explain events by identifying their causes, namely an actor that impinges upon an entity. Human intuitive physics differs from real physics, but it helps them to reason and agree about aspects of reality relative to their purposes, their understanding of cause and effect, what they can know, change, and will, how they identify and quantify their experience, and how they assign moral and legal responsibility. Humans not only have thoughts, but steep them with emotion. They stand in awe of deities. They are terrified by disease, death, and infirmity. They are revolted by bodily secretions. They loathe enemies, traitors, and subordinate peoples. They take a prurient interest in sexuality in all its variations. Despite having negative reactions to so many thoughts, humans willingly inflict these thoughts on one another to remind them of the unpleasant nature of certain things, to intimidate or den denigrate them, to get their attention, or to advertise their reactions to life's frustrations and setbacks. When it comes to social life, humans are very, very touchy about their relationships. With some of their fellows, typically kin, lovers, and friends, humans freely share and do favors. With others, they jockey for dominance. With still others, they trade goods and services. People distinguish these relationships sharply, and when one person breaches the logic of a relationship with another, they both suffer an emotional cost. Nonetheless, humans often risk these breaches, sometimes to get on with the business of life, sometimes to renegotiate their, their relationship. Humans think a lot about what other humans think about them, and their relationships are ratified by this mutual knowledge. They know that others know that they know what kind of relationship they share. As a result, to preserve their relationships while transacting the business of their lives, humans often engage in hypocrisy and taboo. With that, I'll end. Thank you very much.
Steven Pinker, previously with MIT, is a professor of psychology at Harvard. He's the author of several books, including The Blank Slate and How the Mind Works. For more, visit pinker.wjh.harvard.edu.